Good morning, everyone. We are so happy you're here today. Happy Wednesday. Uh, we will be starting in about um, two minutes. So uh, please hang on for a minute, go grab your cup of coffee, and uh, we look forward to visiting with you in a couple minutes. Hi, Janine. Hello. Hi, guys. Hello. Nice to see everybody. So I'm going to remind everyone today we are recording. So uh, please uh, keep muted and please uh, consider the comments you make during this training. Uh, we will start in about uh, three minutes, two, three minutes. So grab your cup of coffee, grab your breakfast, um, put your students on hold for a minute and uh, we will be with you momentarily. Good morning, everyone. So good to see some of my sweet friends here today. Thank you so much for coming. All right, we will start. It is five after, and I'm going to start with some introductions. So good morning to everyone. Uh, we are so thankful that you're here with us for this hour and a half. It's so great to see you all. Um, happy Wednesday and happy back to school. Uh, we are here today with our wonderful Tri-County Regional Center. My name is Jennifer Connolly from Santa Barbara County, Silpa. I am the proud coordinator and love my partnership with uh, my wonderful Tri-County ladies and gentlemen here today. Uh, we have a wonderful treat um, sharing information on Tri-County Regional Center. So I would like to introduce a few people and Cecilia, I think you would probably do it best. So I'm going to turn it over to you and I will continue admitting people. Okay. Uh, before, before I do, I just want to remind everyone that we are recording, so be mindful of um, some of the things you share. Please, please, please put any questions you have in the chat, and we will definitely um, address those questions as we go through our presentation. We will have one breakout room today uh, for just a brief discussion. And so um, that recording will stop for that. And then we will come and share back our findings with our whole group. So I just wanna thank you all again for coming. Thank my wonderful Tri-County partners. And um, Cecilia, I'll let you take it away. Hi, um, good morning everybody and welcome. Thank you all for being here. Um, like Jennifer said, we're very excited um, to share what Tri-Counties is all about and to have a conversation with you guys and see how we can better improve uh, our, our collaboration. So today, um, so I am the manager for the transition team and it's actually one transition team that covers the whole county. So we cover all the way from uh, Guadalupe all the way down to uh, Carpinteria. So we are one team that covers the whole county. And today we are having Vanessa, she will be doing a part of the presentation. Good morning, uh, we everyone. Have, <laughs> yes. And we have uh, Margo. She is um, trying to log in. So she should join us soon. 
And we also have Joey. Morning. She will be doing the employment piece of the presentation. Um, there's also other service coordinators, but I'm not able to see them right now, but you guys will get to meet them um, during the breakout rooms. So we have other service coordinators that, um, that are here too. So again, we're very, very excited to, to be here and to um, talk to you guys about Tri-Counties. So I think we are ready to start. Let me just check really quick on Margo. Um, okay, it sounds like she might be having some issues with her audio. Um, all right, so we'll start with Vanessa and then we'll see um, if Margo can join us. If not, then I will take over. All right. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Vanessa. Um, uh, like Cecilia said, I'm service coordinator on the, tri on the transition team in Santa Maria. And uh, we're gonna begin with a video, um, just kind of going over a brief overview of what we do here at Tri-Counties. And I think it does a really good job of just kind of having a snippet of some of the questions that may come up. Um, and it, it's, really, it's a really neat video. So Cecilia is gonna share that right now. Yes, I will share my screen right now. Let me see if I can make it bigger. Do a full screen. There you go. Yes. Cecilia, is there sound? Yeah, the volume is really low, Cecilia. <laughs> For a minute. What was that? The volume is super low. Oh, okay. Give me a second. Let's see. Let me turn the volume up. Let's try this again. How about now? No? Okay, I wonder if I need to do something different. Um, you may need to share your computer screen I've, or share your sound. Okay. All right. I don't have that option at this time. Okay, share sound. Okay, let's try it. Centered services and supports for people with developmental disabilities living in San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. The Regional Center is dedicated to person-centered practices. This means treating each individual with dignity and respect and empowering them to set and reach their own personal goals. California's Regional Centers are guided by the Lanterman Act, the California law that states that individuals with developmental disabilities have a right to services and supports to help them have greater influence and more positive control in their lives. Regional center services are identified by a planning team based on an individual's needs. Services may include respite, daycare, residential care, early start, behavioral support, transportation, day programs, employment services, supported living services, and more. A lot of people wonder what are the conditions that are regional center eligible conditions. Those are autism, also known as autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, which is the new term for what was called mental retardation, cerebral palsy, and epilepsy, which is also known as seizure disorder, and something called the fifth category, which is a condition similar to or requiring treatment similar to that of an intellectually disabled individual. Now, one thing that's very important for persons to understand is that qualifying developmental disability has to originate prior to the 18th birthday. To qualify for regional center services, an individual has to demonstrate a substantial developmental delay Tri-County's Regional Center conducts a detailed assessment to determine whether an individual may be eligible to receive Regional Center services. If the person is found eligible for Regional Center services, they are assigned to a service coordinator, that's our term for social workers, a person who will help set up what's called the Individualized Program Plan or the IPP and 
helped hook them up with the appropriate services. Tri-County's Regional Center's person-centered planning process allows for each and every individual, parent, friend or family member to have a voice in making decisions regarding supports and services for themselves or a loved one. The Early Start Program is part of the U.S. Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and serves children from birth to three years of age. Parents play a vital role on their children's planning team. Early Start serves two categories of children. The first is children who have been identified with an established risk at birth or shortly after birth. An example would be a child who is born with Down syndrome or with infantile spasms or some other kind of medical condition that gives us a very strong suspicion that they're going to have a lifelong developmental disability. Included in this category is the extremely premature baby born prior to 28 weeks gestation who typically has a great array of medical complications that puts them at high risk for at least developmental delay. The second group and the larger group actually are the children who are born fine, everything's going along pretty well and then parents start being aware or the physicians become aware that some delays are starting to happen. Early intervention services may be provided in the family or caregiver's home or at a preschool or daycare center. The regional center is committed to providing services in the most inclusive natural environments. Early Start services are really driven by the individualized family service plan. Once a child is determined eligible for services, the team meets with the family and develops a plan identifying goals or outcomes that are the priorities for the family for work and then the, the plan also identifies which services are going to be provided. An example of services is specialized instruction which is provided by a child development specialist, uh, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, vision services, uh, services for children who are, are hard of hearing or deaf, Every six months we do a new developmental evaluation and determine did the child meet the goals, did they not meet them, what needs to happen next for the next six months. My name is Daniela. I am the mother of a two and a half year old uh, boy named Lucas. So Lucas has cystic fibrosis. He was diagnosed when he was three weeks old. We noticed around 20 months old that he had a little bit of a delay on his speech. He would really get frustrated and aggressive when he wanted something and couldn't communicate. So he would try, he would look at us and, you know, try really hard. Eventually he would explode crying and just throw himself on the floor or throw toys or just get really frustrated, which was also very frustrating for us. So I looked for the program and I wish I had done it before. We see three different girls, two of them speech therapists, one of them an occupational therapist. They come to see Lucas twice per week. They are teaching me sign languages, for example, and you know how to teach him sign languages. It teaches us techniques as well. For example, before I had toys spread all over the house. So she said, just put everything away, hide it, or put it at height so that he can see it and he can ask for it, which never occurred to me. To me, it was more about you know making him stay in a fun environment, which wasn't necessarily helping him. Early intervention supports an infant's development within the existing family structure. Services are intended to respond to needs expressed by parents or caregivers, facilitate quality parent and infant interaction, and develop growth fostering activities. I've been working with them for a little over six months now. He still uses mostly sign languages. He's trying to talk very hard, he's trying to imitate sounds, but he's, he's mostly making more eye contact, which we didn't see before. Um, and he's, you know, just telling us if he wants more of something and he's pointing more at things and he's overall just, you know, happier little child. And he's, I think he's understanding how important communication, how fun communication is now. Family Resource Centers, or FRCs, provide support to families of people with disabilities of all ages. For families of infants and toddlers, FRCs work in partnership with the regional centers and schools to share information about early intervention services. FRCs offer a variety of supports, including prevention services, information and referral, peer counseling, home visits, and parent education. 
They also publish regular email newsletters and calendars of local support groups and events. Our primary focus is providing parent-to-parent -parent support. Most of us have children of our own with disabilities. We provide resources, support from somebody who's already been in their shoes and knows, knows maybe what they're feeling. It's very satisfying when you've met a family who, um, in the early stages of their child being diagnosed, they're panicked and emotional and scared and they feel like there's nothing out there for them. And then following that journey along with that family and eventually seeing how they just fit right into the community and how the family has realized that, you know, just because your child has a disability, it's not the end of the world. There can be some wonderful, you know, joyful aspects to it. The primary provider of services for school-aged children is the public education system. In some situations, the planning team may identify a need that is appropriate to receive non-educational regional center services. Services may include respite from caregiving, behavior management, and support for getting involved in the community. The regional center can also assist in coordinating services such as medical, dental, psychiatric, occupational and physical therapy with various community agencies and public resources, including Medi-Cal, and private insurance. My name is Linda Miyahira. This is my son, Ronan Battles. When he was born, we found out he had Down syndrome, which was a total shock. We had no idea. Regional Center was notified by the uh, NICU department over at the hospital, and we got our first call. And it was really wonderful. The first thing they said, they greeted me with congratulations, which is something you don't hear. You're just hearing of all the, the prognosis, the diagnoses, issues with your child, but you don't hear the positive. So it was really a nice greeting. And immediately they hooked me up with um, Rainbow Resources, <laughs> with a parent match. And then the uh, service coordinator immediately came over to our home. Life has greatly improved um, for our family because of Tri-Counties Regional Center. His service coordinator immediately got us into a behavioral program and it really made a huge difference. I can't say enough good things about um, the programs and about Regional Center. They've walked with me every step of the way and they continue to as Ronan, he's 16, so he's going to be going into the transition phase now from school to possibly employment or a day center, whatever it is that's gonna be best for him. He's gonna guide us and he really is but they make it a very calm, soothing way. As youth, age 16 to 22, enter their final years of high school, there are many options to consider and choices to make as school services are ending. Regional Center service coordinators are there to help young people with developmental disabilities and their families plan for adulthood. Adult day programs may be explored. The Regional Center can also help with accessing benefits, including SSI and Medi-Cal. My advice for parents as your son or daughters uh, growing up and becoming an adult, they need to gain independence. That means they need to sort of assert themselves and grow more as an individual and rely less on you. And there's many, many things that, that TCRC and other providers can do to assist you with that but you gotta let go. It's so funny, and every parent will tell you this, when you finally give up the doing everything for them, you find out how much they can actually do or have been able to do. He can fold laundry, he can do some dishes. So now I feel like, dude, you, know, you need to go and do some of your, yeah. these chores too. Beyond the school years, Tri-Counties Regional Center continues to provide services to eligible adults with developmental disabilities to support them throughout their adult lives. These services include day programs, behavioral support, transportation, employment, supported living services, and more. Many programs offer topics such as maintaining self-care skills, interacting with others, and making one's needs known. Some focus on behavior management or developing social and recreational skills. Such programs also help people develop employment skills and learn how to access community services. There are many levels of advocacy available, both on a local and a statewide level.
to ensure people with developmental disabilities receive the supports and services they need. If there's a disagreement about services or decisions made by the regional center or by the educational system, Disability Rights California is available to advocate for individuals and families on a legal level. Tri-County's Regional Center also offers programs that promote self-advocacy for individuals with developmental disabilities. What I find most fulfilling about advocacy is a lot of individuals, through no fault of their own, through no fault of their parents or well-meaning providers, have often sheltered them to the point where they haven't had a chance to make decisions or to find out about things or grow in the ways that, that many of us get to. And so self-advocacy through the groups that TCRC supports give the individual the chance to learn to make decisions. It can be something as simple as what to wear that day, what to do that day. And just like anyone else, when you start making those decisions, it's easier to make bigger and bigger ones. So you go from what to wear, what to do, to what's my day gonna be like? Where am I gonna try to find work? What am I gonna do for the rest of my life? You can't begin to look at those until you make the smaller decisions first. TCRC and advocacy does that for individuals. Individuals, providers, and family members can also get involved at a statewide level to help adopt or change legislation that guides services and supports for persons with developmental disabilities. As you have seen, Tri-County's Regional Center is dedicated to providing person and family-centered supports for individuals with developmental disabilities to maximize opportunities and choices for living, working, learning, and recreating in our community. This has been very personally ins inspiring to me to see children blossoming, children that I work with as, as little elementary school kids I run into in the community because I've been doing this for a long time and I now run into them working out in the community and I see them with their girlfriends and their boyfriends and at jobs and seeing that they have done so much and there's been so much hard work to get them there. It's like watching flowers just grow and reward you with this beauty. The most rewarding thing to me is sort of seeing the light bulb go on. When I see an individual who's never had a chance to voice their opinion and have it be heard, or make a decision and have it carried out, when they get that done and I see that self-confidence grow, it's huge, it's life-changing. I absolutely feel that we're making a huge difference. Okay, so that video did a, a really good job of kind of going over um, different aspects of Tri-Counties. Um, and we're going to kind of pull out a little bit of the information from the video um, and go over that. So um, who we are. So we're one of 21 regional centers in California, and we cover the um, Santa Barbara, San Luis, and Ventura counties. And we provide uh, services and supports throughout the individual's life. So it's not just one portion of their life, it's throughout the whole, their whole lifetime. So that's something that many don't necessarily know. Um, they believe that it stops at a certain time or the, the eligibility um, expires or something, but no, it's throughout their whole lifetime. And like the video said, our mission um, is to provide uh, the individuals and families with the services and supports just to maximize their overall life. So whatever that looks like for him, for them. So it's in school, it's at home, it's where they're recreating, it's making friends, any services like that. So next slide. And like the video said, there are actually five um, eligibilities. 
that we look at and it's intellectual disability, autism, cerebral palsy, epilepsy. And there's a fifth category as well. And that looks like, like has, as Dr. Graf um, explained in the video, um, any intellectual disability that looks like, or you would need the services just like any other of the previous four disabilities. So if it's very similar to, but it's not quite there, that would fall under the fifth category. And those individuals are eligible for all the Tri-County services. There's no, there's no issue there. Um, and th this continues the qualifications for the services. So um, the disability has to have shown prior to them being 18. So there has to have, there has to be history, medical history, school history, showing that the disability was there before 18. And there's the, there has to be a significant um, disability in three or more of these areas. So basically the functional areas of life, so learning, self-direction, self-care, being able to be independent with their finances, all, all those um, would qualify, they have three. So they would um, be able to qualify for Tri-Counties Regional Center under those. And there is an assessment as well that goes with uh, Tri-Counties and receiving services and becoming eligible. So we um, at Tri-Counties do that assessment as well. And the service coordinator. So what we do, we work with so many different entities um, in, in the individual's life. So whoever the, the program coordinators, the managers, the directors, the IEP chairs, um, we, we all try to work together to get the services and supports that that individual needs um, just, just to thrive. So we, we actually attend a lot of the IEPs and we also attend behavioral wellness meetings. We attend court. Um, if the individual wants us there and feels like that would be helpful, we try to make it happen. And we, um, we're not, you know, we're, we don't have like, oh, we don't do that. We really want to work with their teams and the families just so everybody can feel supported and everybody kind of knows where the individual wants to go and where the family wants them to go and see them thrive. And I believe this is where Margo was going to take over. She's here. She is here. Okay. Margo? I was just, let me ask you to unmute. Can, oh, can you guys hear and see me now? We can hear you, Margo, yes. You can see me? Okay, I am so sorry. <laughs> I apologize, I was having computer issues. I'm on my phone, so I can't see how you can see me. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, but anyway, just introduce myself. I'm Margo Brockdrup, and I am a service coordinator on the transition team. And um, I have to look at my computer to be able to see what these PowerPoints are. So um, just wanted to talk a little bit about the IPP, which is our individual program plan. And that is the plan that we set up for every individual that we work with. And that covers different categories. We really talk, um, mainly it covers three categories. We talk about their health and any issues they might have around that and any needs that they have. Uh, we'll talk about school or work, or you know, what they're doing in terms of how they spend their day. And then we also talk about where they're living. And um, as Vanessa said, you know, we have individuals, especially on the transition team, we have some young people who are living at home, um, others who are living independently, um, some who are living in group homes. And so we'll talk about, uh, you know, where they're living and what that looks like for them. Any services that Tri-Counties provides for any individuals gets written into this plan with an agreement between them and their families on what that service will look like, what the length of time for that service will be, and then um, you know how that service is going to be uh, delivered to them. So next slide, please. Okay, so person-centered planning. Um, this is really at the heart of everything that we do at Tri-Counties. 
What person-centered it means is we really look at the whole individual. We take into account everything about them, how they work within their family, how they work within their school, or again, their job or wherever they're, if they're attending a program. We also look at how they connect to their community. And we really look at a couple of different things. We look at what's important to a person. So how do they like to spend their time? What are the things that matter in their life? And for each individual, that could be very different things. We also look at what's important for them. You know, what do they need um, to keep them safe, to keep them healthy? You know, what do they need in their life? And so that's really, like I said, at the center of everything that we, we do with them. Um, and we really try when we're working with somebody in going back to the, um, the individual program plan, we really listen to what they need. What do they want? What's again, what's important for them? And I'll be honest, sometimes that is challenging for people to come up with that. Sometimes they don't know. So again, I think part of our role as a service coordinator is to help kind of elicit that. You know, what is it really kind of listen to what they're saying and really, you know, try to weed that out for them. Um, next slide, please. So the transition to um, adult services. Okay, so uh, as a transition team service coordinator, uh, we work with the young people between 14 and 22. Now we've, you know, it's up to about age 26. And so we really start to work with them while they're in high school and begin to look at what is that going to look like in terms of their transition to, to being an adult. Um, so we can talk about you know, what they're gonna be doing for their, again, are they gonna continue their education? Are they going to work? You know, where are they going to live? We really try to look at all of that. And as you know, you know within, within the IEP at about age 16, there starts to be a transition plan. And so you know, that's, that's also part of what we do is really, again, working, starting very young to work on that transition plan. Um, this can be a challenging time for individuals and their families um, because they're, you know, they're really looking at, you know, what's going to happen when they, when they do become adults. Um, I'm trying to think anything else. I think that's about it. Okay, next slide because I want to talk about this. <laughs> I think this is a really important piece. The um, collaboration between Tri-Counties and the schools. Um, I will tell you that again, as a transition service coordinator, it is very important for me to have information from the schools. The teachers really know the individuals that we work with. The teachers see them every day uh, for many hours and I think really have a good sense often of what they need. And so for us to be able to work together um, is incredibly important. Um, it is important for service coordinators to attend IEP meetings so that we know what is going on. And sometimes we can provide information on a different level that the schools might not be hearing. Sometimes we know what's going on at home that can also be impacting what's happening at school. So I think this is just really a very big piece of this. I know we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, um, but I can't you know, emphasize enough how important it is that Tri-Counties and the schools really work um, you know, work together to develop. That helps us in terms of our, you know, our plans. So, okay, I see my slides gone. Okay. <laughs> um, so, this is an important one too. If you know someone who has not yet been referred to Tri-Counties, but you believe that they may be eligible, please have them contact our office. Um, and then we can do, um, you know, we can, they can go through the intake process. Um, the other thing that is really important is sometimes people are not aware of if they are actually with Tri-Counties. Um, I have seen this on several occasions where someone actually has been with Tri-Counties, but their case is not active. Um, we have to stay in contact with families, and if for any reason we're not able to maintain that contact, their case might be closed. In order to reopen it, to reactivate it, it is as simple as calling us, and then they can ask that that be uh, that their case be reactivated. If they are an adult over 18, they must make the phone call or be with their parents when they call. Um, if they're a minor, then the, the family can call. Um, and you know, I just think that one of the things that's also important for everybody to know is that school services, as we know, end at age 22, 
and the services with Tri-Counties, um, an individual, once they are with us, um, they, are, they receive services throughout their entire lifetime as long as they need and want those services. And next slide, how to contact us. This is our information. Uh, within this county, we have two offices. We have our Santa Barbara office and our Santa Maria office, and the numbers are up here. Um, again, if you have any questions or if a family has questions, they can contact us, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that they have. Margo, we do have a Marco, we do have a question, and I know sure. it's in the chat and has been answered, but I want to ask it anyways out loud. Uh, sure. Can you can you clarify? Um, does uh, a young uh, person need to apply for serve? Can they apply for services at any age? But the disability has to have occurred before age eighteen. Yes, that, that is correct, Jennifer. They can, um, at any age as an adult, they can contact us and go through the intake process. Um, but yes, they have to have some type of proof that the disability did happen prior to age 18. And so that can be notes from their doctor. It could be an IEP that indicates that they have a diagnosis, but we do need something to have, um, something that says that yes, it happened prior to age 18. And, and I'm assuming an IEP, I think you just said it, the IEP would be appropriate as well for that documentation. Yes, it, it definitely could be. Mm -hmm. We will do our own testing anyway, but if someone, for example, has an IEP that ha and they have a diagnosis of autism, we would definitely be taking that into consideration. So yes, so we just ask that families bring any documentation that they have. Uh, there's a second question here. Is sure. there a staff directory available to the public um, to know how to um, tap into certain age groups for support? I can answer that question. And I think um, the best way to get in contact with us is calling the main number. When you call the main number, um, then they can direct you to the person that you need to talk to. I think that's the best way to uh, get a hold of anyone at Tri-Counties. It's through the main, the main number. Yes, and there's also, um, this next slide shows our website. There's mm -hmm. also a lot of information on our website that is accessible to anyone. Um, and so people can just go on there um, to try to get some information. But yeah, I think like Cecilia said, if somebody's not aware, sometimes again, they may not know who their service coordinator is, even if they have one, um, you know, the best way is to contact the main office. Um, we also, we always have someone who's the officer of the day who is available to families or to anyone who needs that information. So I don't know if there are any other questions, and I think uh, if not, I think I am turning this over to Joey. Uh, we have one more. I'm sorry, one sure. more question. Um, I think people are processing uh, right now. Uh, what does the process look like once a referral has been made, and how long does the process typically take to determine if someone is eligible for service? So I believe the the participants asking, what does the process look like? Um, and then how long does it take? Okay, so we, we have an intake, we have intake coordinators. And so once somebody makes that initial phone call, they will be contacted by the intake person who would set up a time to meet with them. Um, there's paperwork that needs to get filled out, some testing um, in, in order. And it, again, they may be, you know, they may need different types of testing to, to determine eligibility. Uh, in terms of how long it takes, I'm not sure I can answer that. I don't know, Cecilia, if you have a better um, idea I'm, on that one. Yeah, I know that with intake, they have a very specific timeline. Um, I know Catherine's on the line. Catherine, do you remember that specific um, timeline that they have for intake? I believe Gosh, it's I, 100 I, and something I days. Services, I'm a little removed. I'm not quite sure. But yeah, there is a very specific timeline that they have to, from the day that they first call, to when they have to complete the whole process. So usually the intake coordinator will stay uh, in contact with the family or the person who is um, requesting the, um, you know, the determination for eligibility, uh, but they have a very specific timeline. Like I said, I believe, I don't wanna give the wrong actual number, but there's a very specific timeline that they follow when it comes to intake. 
right and i and i and i'm aware of that too and that's why i didn't i don't know the specific um but it, it can you know it can take a while i think so people should not expect to call and then the next day you know have services so mm -hmm. it could take it, it will take a while and it will also depend on how many um, intakes we have at any given time we do tend to get a lot more of them around this time of year. I want to I want to just say that because people go back to school and I really appreciate I think that some of the schools have done a really good job of talking with families about that and saying that they believe that somebody might be eligible and, and then asking them to contact us. Thank you for those questions and please continue to um, add questions in the chat. We will definitely get to them. I know things happen as we um, continue to process through information. So um, Cecilia, would you like to introduce our next speaker? Yes. Um, so to, uh, we have Joey. She is our employment coordinator. Um, this is a kind of new position that we have added um, not too long ago because we understand the importance of employment and uh, we wanted someone to just be really in charge of this uh, part of um, what we do. So Joey will be talking more about uh, employment, the paid internship programs that we have. Thank you, Cecilia. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everybody. Um, so um, basically what I wanna share with you is some legislation around employment first policy. Um, this position was created in 2016 in order to address some, some changes in the law around employment for individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, so what the law says about it, oh, I minimized my screen, sorry about that. Um, what the law says about it basically is that um, we're, we're really focused on everyone having equal opportunity. And for individuals without disabilities who are graduating high school, the focus is really on, would you like to go into education? Would you like to go into looking for a job, you know, meaning college or vocational programs, work? Um, and, and so we need to have the same discussions with people with disabilities that we do for those without. Um, so what the law actually says is that for anyone 16 or older, who's served by regional center, when you sit down with your service coordinator and you talk about transition from high school, the very first thing that we must consider under the law is employment. Um, that does not mean that one has to choose employment. Um, it just means that we need to have those conversations um, because that is the focus for everyone um, graduating from high school, what's next? Um, and another important part of this is that is true, regardless of the severity of anyone's disability. We can go to the next slide. So um, we talk about, um, I, I don't know if you've heard the term CIE. This stands for Competitive Integrated Employment. Um, and this is something that you'll hear a lot um, in the school setting, in the vocational rehabilitation setting with Tri-Counties Regional Center. This is um, the gold standard for employment. Um, and you can keep going um, until all of those show, that's fine, thank you. Um, so, so basically competitive integrated employment means we're in the community, we have a, a regular job, it's not anything specialized for a person with a disability, it's not a group setting. Um, so the person is making a competitive wage, um, same rate of pay as others with the same experience level, um, it can be full or part time. It can include self. It can include self employment and micro enterprises. Um, but basically, it's one person, one job, without any um, special circumstances. That does not mean that job coaching can't be provided and other supports. Um, but the job itself um, should look like any other job. Go to the next slide. So this is a one page profile. It's a person centered planning tool that we use a lot at regional center. Um, and what it helps us do is focus first on who the person is, what's important to them, what their strengths and experiences are before we go into what would be a great job for this person. Um, so in this example, we have um, listed some of the things, some of the tasks that the person does at home. They're able to keep the room clean. They're very detailed. Um, they've prepared dinner, uh, things that they like, dancing, nature, dogs. Um, 
So the other category is what is one thing I never want to do? You know, for me, that was working in fast food. When I was 16, I said, I never want to work in fast food. Um, and I never did. So it's important to know what people like, what their interests are, and what they're not interested in as well. Um, and then the other thing we want to look at, oh, I'm sorry, could you go back one? The other thing we want to look at is, um, you know, what are education and training goals? Does the person have um, any government benefits that might be affected by employment wages? And if so, how can we plan for that so that you know what to expect, the student knows what to expect? We also look at transportation. Um, any accommodations a student is receiving at school could transfer over to employment. So these are, these are all things. And one last thing on this is that when we talk about past experiences, we're not just talking about past jobs. Um, we had a young man who watched the Weather Channel and knew everything there was to know about weather. So we considered an internship for him at a weather station. Doesn't mean he had any work experience there but he had some kind of experience around that. So we really wanna be, be very broad. Okay, next slide. Um, so one question I get a lot is whose responsibility is what? If a student needs, uh, needs help on the job, um, is this TCRC's responsibility? Is this the school's responsibility? Is it Department of Rehabilitation? Is it the workforce development agencies like our workforce resource centers and America's job centers? Um, so whose responsibility is what? So I pulled out here from the four laws, basically, that govern our services, what the responsibilities of each of those agencies is. So for Tri-Counties, our role in employment is to attend transition IEPs when we're invited, which we hope is all the time. <laughs> Um, to provide referrals to the Department of Rehab when requested, and that can be requested in a transition IEP. Um, and then reimbursement of paid internship program wages and employer costs, if that's something identified in the individualized program plan. Schools responsibilities are simply to do employment related assessments and to have a statement of needs in the transition plan based on that assessment and then supported employment services if needed and if listed in the IEP or the Individualized Transition Plan. Department of Rehab's role is to coordinate pre-employment transition services, which can include paid work experience, to determine eligibility for supported employment services if requested, and to provide supported employment services if eligible and listed in their individual plan for employment. So I hope you're seeing a theme here that, that the services that each of these agencies are required to provide must be in those plans. And I know those acronyms get crazy. We've got TCRC has an IPP, schools have an ITP or an IEP, DOR has an IPE. So forget all the acronyms. Everybody has a, a role here and hopefully this guide will, will help simplify it. The, the role of workforce development is to assist with job search assistance for students with and without disabilities, um, to identify and support people with workplace accommodations, to do skills training, to provide internships and supported work experience for youth, including those who are youth who have graduated or in college or who are homeschooled, um, and then lastly, to offer apprenticeships in highly skilled occupations. Um, we're, we're trying to move away from um, the model that people start in an entry level job and kind of work their way up. Um, competitive integrated employment and employment first as we start at the top. Um, we're gonna start with regular employment. And if, if that doesn't work for you, we can look at other options below that. But we wanna, we wanna start with the gold standard. Next slide. So there are two, at least two paid work experiences available to students. There are, of course, others available through our workforce development agencies. But through um, Department of Rehab and Tri-Counties, I get a lot of questions about which one should we go with? Um, how do we decide which one to use? And if we, if we use both, which one comes first? So these programs are meant to have a lot of flexibility. And this is all very individualized. 
If you have a student with no work history, um, they might want to do a student work experience with Department of Rehab first. Um, those paid work experience last up to 100 hours, and their goal is to develop skills that will be applicable to any job. Um, the jobs typically are not um, selected based on personal interests. It's just, let's get some experience. Um, TCRC's paid internship program is more individualized. We say, where would you like to work? Um, anywhere you can think of, you know, we'll reach out and contact the employer and see if you can do an internship there for which we'll pay the wages, any employer costs, payroll costs, um, and we'll take the liability if one of our vendors is paying the intern. Um, so for regional center work experience, the student must be 18 or older. Um, for Department of Rehab, they can be 16 to 21. So those are some things you might consider when deciding on the programs. Um, you do not have to use Department of Rehab service first. If you have someone you feel would be a good match for our internship program, you can refer directly to the service coordinator for that. Next slide. So uh, we've kind of covered this, but who can be an intern? Um, first, they have to be able to work in California. They have to be eligible for regional center services. And when I say intern, I'm talking about an intern through regional center. And students must be 18 years of age or older. Next slide. So um, what are the reasons someone might want to do an internship? Uh, to try out different careers, build skills, add to a resume, become a stronger job candidate somewhere they're already working, obtain competitive integrated employment. Um, they can also use an internship to try out different jobs and just um, see what, I guess that's try out different careers, but you know, if someone's really not sure what focus they wanna go with, um, they can do multiple short internships at different places and find out what they like. Next slide. So um, just to emphasize that an internship can be done anywhere. Um, I, we just really want to, to throw that out there because what we see a lot is if someone starts out in a job they're not really interested in, I'm not gonna perform my best if I don't like the job I'm doing. And um, if, you, if you evaluate me based on my performance in a job I don't like, I might not have a very good review. Um, but if I'm doing something I'm passionate about, something that's in my area of interest, I'm gonna give it my best. Evaluate me on that. So that's why it's important to say that internships can be done anywhere in the interest or strengths, in an area of interest or strengths um, of the student. Next slide. So this is a tool and I'm, I've posed, I'm going to hit enter and post this in the chat right now. The second link there is to this flyer. This is a great tool for transition teachers. This is a flyer designed for employers and it's on the paid internship program. So if you have a student who wants to do an internship but they don't quite know how to word that to an employer and explain it to them, they can use this flyer and the other side of the form has a, a place for the employer to talk about what job they have available they might like an intern for, um, what requirements does that person need to have. Um, and this will give you all of the information to take to your service coordinator and say, we have an internship placement we'd like to explore. Next slide. So job coaching for the paid internship program is a topic that comes up a lot. So you have a student who wants to do an internship um, at a radio station, um, but he needs support. Who's gonna provide that? Uh, so Tri-Counties can authorize job coaching and other supports for individuals who are no longer in school, no longer eligible for public education. Um, so if they have a diploma, no problem. If they have a certificate of completion, under the IDEA, the Individuals with De Developmental Dis well, Disabilities Education Act, they can return to school and request an IEP. So we would not be able to fund job coaching. However, we have within the last couple of years revised our policy to say 
that we know that the purpose of school transition services is to prepare a student for employment. And if they go to Department of Rehab and they're receiving job coaching and support from the Department of Rehab and they finish those services, they get to the point where they're stable and they wanna to transition to regional center for long-term funding, we'll pick it up at that point. Even if they're 16 years old, um, we will pay for job coaching as long as they've gone through DOR first because that tells us they're ready for competitive integrated employment and sending them back to the school to say, you know, they're not 22 yet just doesn't make any sense. Um, funding for job coaching is separate from the internship program and will not affect the number of internship hours that are authorized. And um, lastly, if um, it's a student that we cannot fund job coaching for, schools can contract with our providers to, to get job coaching services for a student. Basically, that means you can use our service providers and the school district or SELPA or you know whatever the, the funding agency is can pay for those contracted services if it's in the IEP. <laughs> so um, how do you request an internship? Um, there are two very simple steps. One is to call the service coordinator. Um, if the teacher wants to facilitate this, that's fabulous. The student needs to be on the phone with you present with you. In some way, the student and the service coordinator need to connect. That is the bare minimum definition of what we call a planning team meeting, which is how services get authorized. So contact the service coordinator with the student present, and then you can go to our website and click on a link to fill out the internship request form. Um, and that is what gets the ball rolling. From that, it's an automated form that um, takes care of everything else all the way through to getting the service authorized. Um, anyone can fill out that form. It does not have to be one of our service providers or service coordinators. A teacher can fill out that form. A parent can fill out that form. Um, so I've put on here how to access that. Um, you just go to our website, click on what we do, employment services, and then scroll down to the bottom of the page and here's the link you'll see. Next slide. Okay, and lastly, I just wanted to give you a sample pathway to employment. There can be a million different possibilities for what someone's pathway to employment looks like. This is one example. So um, let's say we have a, a student who's in high school and they're doing transition planning. Um, and through transition planning, you ask about um, cash aid. You realize the person receives supplemental security income. So then you say, well, you know, I don't want this person's benefits to be affected by their employment wages or internship wages. So let's contact a counselor from the Department of Rehab and get some planning around what that might look like and develop a plan for how those benefits might be affected. Um, so from there, we go on to a paid work experience. In this case, the person chooses to go through the, the DOR program, that 100 hour paid work experience program. Um, and after that, they've, they've got some basic job skills and they're thinking about a job somewhere else. Um, so they go to the Workforce Resource Center. Um, that's, there's one in Santa Maria, one in Santa Barbara, and they do a job search there. So they find that there's a dance club hiring. Um, they want someone who can um, you know, help guide students individually in the dance club. Person says, that sounds like something I'm really interested in. If you look at that one page profile, um, dancing was one of the interests. So we set up an internship at a dance club. And you know, at that club, they meet the DJ. And they're really excited about what the DJ does. And they think, you know, I might want to have my own business as a DJ. So maybe the person wants to enroll in a college class in music to get some, some background that would support that goal. Um, after that, um, or in school, they can use the learning assistance program at Hancock College or Santa Barbara City College. Um, those are also called dis Disabled Student Services and Programs. Um, to get extra tutoring or whatever support they need to be successful at school. 
Then they could come back and do a second internship with TCRC as a self-employment internship. And what that would look like is they would go to work with the DJ and they would learn what's involved in having my own business as a DJ. Do I have to you know, be able to transport my equipment around? Um, do I, how do I market and let you know, clubs know that I'm available as a DJ? So um, as part of that, they can develop a, um, a business plan. They can do a third PIP to learn how to market their business if that's needed. Um, and then once they're ready, we can offer them a loan of $1,000 for equipment to get their business started. Um, that is approved by myself and someone from our finance department. All we need is a business plan to look at and approve. So that is one possible path to competitive integrated employment for a student. Any questions around employment? Um, Joey, I just I just wanted to add something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think in when we go back to the, the one page profile and we're really looking at person centered planning, I think it is really important. Sometimes young people don't know uh, the type of employment that they want. Mm -hmm. But I think we really kind of, again, really looking at helping them kind of weed out what are their strengths, what are their interests. Um, sometimes I'll get, I'll ask them, you know, do you want to work indoors? Do you like to work outside? Do you like to, you know, be seated? Do you want to be busy? I think really trying to get in touch with not so much, I'll say not, I don't want to know the specific job that you want, but what, how do you see yourself spending your day? What do you like to do? Because I agree with you, Joey, I think we really want to help people find employment that they enjoy. I think if you enjoy what you're doing, you're going to do a much better job. So sometimes really weeding that out. And then also just sometimes two people will say, I had a young man, when I asked him what his, um, his long-term goal was, it was to be the president of the United States. Okay, that's a definite long-term goal. So what, and what does that look like? Again, what is your, you know, what was, I had to weed out what was his interest? Why did he want, why did he see himself being the president? So I think, you know, we had to talk about, well, that's a very long-term goal. So let's take it back a step. Where can we go now? So I think it becomes really important to try to do that with the young people that we work with. That's a really good point. And that's something that comes up a lot. What do I do with this goal to be a president? You know, that, that may not feel realistic. Um, right. and so you're right about teasing that out. Do, do, does he want to be president or she want to be president because they like being in a leadership role? Is it because they're interested in politics? Is it because they want to um, dress very nice in their job? I mean, there could be a number of reasons. So figuring out what about that is important to them can help us uh, meet the goal, even if their plan is not to become the president at the end of an internship. <laughs> Any questions? The, you, other, Joey. the other link I put in the chat really quickly is a link to our South Santa Barbara County local partnership agreement. There were some questions earlier around um, days that we have to find someone eligible for services and things like that. This document has all of the eligibility and referral requirements for Department of Rehab, Tri-Counties Regional Center, SELPA, Santa Barbara County, um, Office of Education, some of our workforce agencies. So um, please feel free to reference that document. It's public and it's posted on the California Health and Human Services website. Thank so you. Joey, we have a couple questions um, that I'd like to ask you if it's okay. And then I want to circle back um, to um, another question that was for the prior uh, presenters. Um, sometimes uh, families and staff are told that they will not get one-to-one -one support for jobs um, after age 22. Um, so is, is, it, is it the idea that um, we give that one-to-one -one support um, and then that's weaned off. Um, that's actually this, inaccurate. Hopefully a student goes on and does it on their own. No, that's actually inaccurate. Um, we, we provide one-to-one -one support for jobs for those who need it um, for their entire life. There's no um, end date or um, requirements for that other than um, that that's a need. 
Um, also just wanting to know about just uh, general supports in um, Santa Barbara, Santa Maria, um, what it looks like um, as far as job coaching goes. Um, do you use um, like instructional assistance at the school to help with job coaching? Do you use Tri-County Regional Center? How, how, um, how are the supports created for those jobs? Great question. Um, so job coaching can be provided by the Department of Rehab or by Tri-Counties Regional Center. Um, if you, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up job coaching because there's an idea that that has to be one person on the job with you standing over your shoulder helping you with your job tasks. That's what a lot of people think of when they hear um, job coaching. Job coaching can be a telephone check-in after work or on someone's break. Um, where they don't want someone on the job site with them, but they need someone, you know, to say, I had this conversation with my boss. I, I had some trouble communicating what I meant. Can you, can you give me some guidance? Um, it can be someone who's there just, you know, for the first hour of the day to help plan out a schedule. Um, it's really, really individualized. So job coaching can be pretty much anything that is needed that you can put into words to support someone in employment. So in thinking of, of our school partners today um, and our students who are, you know, within that 16 to 22 age range, who um, may be a client of Tri-County Regional Center, um, how can um, Tri-County support schools and um, with um, creating employment opportunities for students uh, while they're still in you know, the, the high school age range, you know, the 16 to 22, and then kind of transition that into adulthood. So um, the transition teacher can contact the service coordinator and the transition teacher can share what's in that, um, that transition folder. You know, their assessments done, career um, counseling, Cal jobs reports, any of that that you can discuss with either a regional center service coordinator or Department of Rehabilitation counselor, we can put our heads together. And um, the best practice though, is to bring the student into the conversation and do person-centered planning with them present. Um, a lot of times we'll put a big piece of paper on the wall and we'll get input from everyone in the room and make sure everything's written down so everyone feels heard. And then we check with the student and say, you know, is, is this of interest to you? Is this what you said? Is this, you know, do you agree with this? And then we're making sure that it's all about the student. Um, Great, and one last question. Uh, what about internships during the summer when school is out? Um, is that an option through regional center under age uh, 22 years of age? Yes, as long as they're 18 years of age, um, students can do internships, whether it's during the summer or during the school year. Fantastic. And then I just want to circle back to Margo and um, Vanessa. There was one question, and I know it was answered in the chat, um, but I just wanted to share um, the question was, uh, what's the best way to connect with a service coordinator during an, uh, to attend an IEP meeting? I, I can address that. So I think if, if a family knows who their service coordinator is, they can contact them directly. Um, we are really trying to work with all of the schools to make sure that we get um, invitations to the IEPs and it, it has been working. Uh, we are getting those, you know, those notices. Um, right now, um, all of the support staff at the schools are sending me the notifications of IEPs because um, they may not know who the service coordinator is and then I'm getting those to the correct service coordinator. So I think, but it is also important for families um, to, you know, to contact us. If a family does not, again, if they do not know who their service coordinator is, they can contact the main office and they can, and whoever um, answers the phone can inform them of whoever their service coordinator is. Great, thank you, Margo. Okay. Perfect. All right, so uh, at this time, we're going to break into two breakout rooms. Uh, you have a question here, and this is something that we've really wanted um, to strengthen as um, a TCRC community and as a school community. And I know that um, I randomly picked the breakout rooms today, so we may have more service coordinators in one, 
Uh, we may have more school partners than the other, I'm not sure. Um, so we'll give that a whirl, but um, please think about these two questions for a minute. Um, how can parents, schools, and TCRC improve their collaboration? So what, um, how can we uh, build our collaboration um, as a school community, a parent community, and with TCRC, and have it be a very fluid, um, wonderful collaboration? And then the second question, what collaborative practices have worked with parents, schools, and TCRC? So what are some things that we have successes in, um, in our collaboration with these three different entities? So um, I will uh, reiterate those questions in the chat, uh, but what I would like to do is call out who will be um, in room one. So room one will be Andy, Catherine, Jamie, Leslie, Margo, Miguel, Monica, Vanessa, Viri, and yeah, I'm gonna slaughter your name. I'm so sorry. Yahari. Yari? Yeah, hi. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> All right. And room two is going to be Kathy, Cecilia, Janine, Jessica, Judy, Kimberly, Nathan, and Aurelia. So if you could choose a uh, person that will take notes, and then that person will share back uh, with our big group um, when we come back. So the two questions, once again, improving collaboration, and then the second one, what is working? What is working? Okay, so please choose a person who will take notes and be able to share back um, with our big group um, in a few minutes. So we'll give about maybe eight minute conversations mm -hmm. and then we'll come back, back uh, to our big group and wrap up. All right, I'm opening the rooms. You will be asked to join a room.
All right, welcome back everyone. I'm hoping you had some lively conversations um, around um, improvement and successes. So I'm going to call on my room one, um, which, uh, which, which I'm hoping we had a leader in that room. So if you can unmute yourself and share your findings on um, improvement for collaboration and then um, what has worked um, with collaborative practices. And Margo, I think you're talking. Um, Mar yeah, you're muted, Margo. Unmute. Okay. Oh, can there you we hear go. Me? Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Somehow I got on safe driving mode. Okay. Um, okay. So we, we talked about a few things. Um, one, we did talk about poss the possibility of having brochures in all of the schools that could be available to families um, to give them information on Tri-Counties. I think that's a very easy thing that we can do. We can get those out to the schools. And then again, it, during an IEP meeting, or if a teacher is talking with, uh, with a student or a case manager is talking with a student to get them that information. Um, the other thing that we talked about, Jamie Johnson from Lompoc School District and I talked about is, you know, just really, again, how do we share the information on who, um, you know, who we both serve. So we're going to try to collaborate on that. So uh, I think having a point person maybe in an, our office, in the Santa Maria office, I've agreed to do that. So Jamie can contact me or the teachers can contact me and then I can let them know who the service coordinator is. Um, Leslie discussed encouraging parents to invite their service coordinators to IEPs and we think that's a great idea. I really do encourage that too. And uh, Miguel just talked about that it's really important to maintain good contact with the teachers, case managers at the schools. So the more that you know, we are in contact with them, um, then you know, again, sharing all the information about the students. So I think anything else you guys that I didn't share? I think one more thing um, that may be helpful that was brought up is really having uh, parents in schools and um, service coordinators look at the employment piece in IEPs and IPPs. Um, I believe uh, sometimes, you know, families don't know maybe to include that in those conversations. So that was something that was brought up as well. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm taking mad notes here. Uh, fantastic, thank you, group one. How about our group two? Hi, um, so for group two, we only got to discuss the first question. <laughs> um, and first we were kind of um, mentioning um, mainly the things that seem to be like that wasn't working. So for example, that there's times that um, the teachers might not really know, even the case managers might not really know if the student is a Tri-Counties um, client or not. Um, so there's that um, he's there that if something can be worked out one way or another to be able to, um, for them to have a clear understanding if, uh, if the student is a Tri-Counties client or not. Um, we also were mentioning about how, if there's any changes with the service coordinator, uh, maybe somebody gets promoted or has moved, has moved on from um, Tri-Counties that um, maybe sometimes the parent also doesn't uh, really know. So we did explain kind of like what our policy is in regards to that, that a letter is sent out to the families. Um, so they do um, receive that, uh, whether there's a change, whether someone is going on leave. Um, and, um, you know, at times maybe the, the parent or the family does not get that letter for some reason or another, uh, but those letters uh, do get sent out. And also once a new service coordinator takes over, whether it's a new person or whether someone is covering, a letter is also sent out. So there was a mention there, if there is any way that maybe a general letter um, can also be sent out to maybe the department chair when there are these changes. So they're maybe aware um, of that. So there was kind of discussions on that, how we can make that possible. And what we kind of came up with is that maybe we can work or collaborate on having more of a, like either a flow chart or a letter with the introduction of who the team is from Tri-Counties and maybe even also for us to know who um, the department chairs are for maybe the special ed department so we know who to contact 
and creating that maybe um, on ongoing for maybe once a year or I don't know, twice a year, whatever consensus, consensus we can come up with, but more or less something like that. Um, and yeah, unless I miss something else, I don't know if anybody else wants to share something. <laughs> I think you you covered it all and and I think Jennifer um, she will share I actually forgot to mention during our group but didn't have time but we Jennifer created a flow chart with everyone's information so there is something already available and she'll share that with us <laughs> so this is our last thing before we close for today um, we love our padlets at SELPA and so we have a padlet here uh, that actually has um, and I'm connecting to it um, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have it loaded. That's interesting. Um, I, I will get it loaded. I apologize, I thought I had done that. Um, I'm gonna go back to my um, information, but I do have a, um, a flow chart that I have created uh, that I will add to this Padlet that has all of our service coordinators um, listed um, in the um, Padlet, as well as um, information related to um, our schools. So um, you will see in the Padlet um, all of the schools throughout our county. There's a few that are um, there's a few that are missing information. Um, so I have to add that in. I'm going to um, be sharing this link out, yes, to all of you very shortly. And I'm opening up my Padlet right now as my um, sorry my information as I'm. Um, as I am getting it up here. So um, this is what our flow chart looks like. And I'll make it larger. I'm hoping, let's see. Um, sorry, it is giving me a hard time sharing. Excuse me. There we go. Uh, so um, you will see here um, our our executive director, Dr. Ray Avila um, at SELPA and my information here. And then I will, con and then continuing down our Tri-County Regional Center um, contacts. So our Santa Barbara office, as well as our Santa Maria office. Um, and then um, additionally, as we, move as we move further down, our service coordinators in the South and our service coordinators in the North. And then we move on to our school districts. So each school district has, um, you'll notice it is organized by North County. Um, and so all of our North County schools are here with our special education directors and their contact information. Uh, and then each school has um, the teachers that would be considered Tri-County Regional Center um, uh, have client, have students that would be Tri-County Regional Center students. So uh, you will see here we have Lockman, uh, Guadalupe, and then I'm just going to keep scrolling down, um, Orcutt. Our teachers are here to the right and their contact information is there. Um, SBCEO, I'm waiting for um, information from them. So that's why it's yellow. Uh, we have Santa Maria Bonita, quite a lot of teachers here. So if you have, um, if you're a service coordinator and you need to contact a particular classroom, you'll notice the school is on the left and then the teachers are on the right. Our wonderful directors have uh, been sharing this information with me all summer and we've been updating this um, each summer uh, or each, I'm sorry, every, um, every so many uh, weeks I've been updating it. So this is all North County. You will notice there, there are yellow um, areas. Those areas have not been completed yet. I'm hoping to get that information from um, the district and the directors. Um, and then we go to our mid-county, which is uh, San Inez Valley Consortium. And you will see all of the schools there. And then um, finally, uh, we go down, and I know I'm making you very dizzy, so please close your eyes if you're getting dizzy. Um, we go down to our South County. I'm sorry, and I and I included Lompoc in our North, in our Mid County as well, uh, Jamie. Just so you know, um, I I consider Lompoc kind of Mid County, so you'll see Lompoc is here as well. 
And then uh, we scroll all the way down to our South County partners, uh, starting in Carpinteria. And you'll see our teachers there. Uh, we have Cold Spring. I need to get some information from uh, Cold Spring, uh, Goleta. And then uh, we have um, Hope School District, Montecito Union. I will be getting information from them, SBCEO once again, and then Santa Barbara. So clearly um, this information I wanna say is confidential within our group here. Um, it will not be completely shared out. Um, it definitely is something that will be changing. As you know, um, staff changes frequently. You'll see on this document um, a variety of a um, couple things where it says missing staff or hiring someone. Um, and so those things, those um, updates will occur um, yearly. Um, as I think um, one of you mentioned, it'd be so nice to have a listing of teachers yearly. And again, um, getting this information from our directors was very challenging um, because uh, there are so many staff, obviously. Um, so this is something I intend to hopefully um, update on a regular basis. Um, I will try to keep up with this um, on a yearly basis. Um, and I will try to encourage those districts that I don't have information from to share uh, their information as well. Uh, but these are the teachers that will be um, working with Tri-County Regional Center with their students. So they're the contacts for you at Tri-County Regional Center if you were to reach out to a particular teacher or classroom. Okay, and I will um, upload this to that Padlet that um, Cecilia shared. Mm -hmm. And I will also upload our presentation today as well. And so that Padlet link that Cecilia shared is live. Uh, we can add to it at any time, which is lovely. So you may see changes. Um, this document may be taken down um, and updated um, again frequently. Uh, so mm -hmm. hopefully that um, I will get the rest of those uh, classrooms um, into this document and then you will have an, an actual um, finished product. It has is, it is taken several months to, to gather that information. Yeah, and I actually have a new service coordinator starting soon. So I'll send you that information for Santa Barbara. Fantastic, so, thank yes. you. Yes, and we need to hire two more <laughs> and then we'll be a full team. <laughs> yes. So thank you, Jennifer. I really wanna thank you for putting this together. I know that it's, it required a lot of time to get all that information. So we, I truly appreciate it. And then just all your collaboration and everyone who participated in the meetings uh, to get this together. So, um, and everyone who's here today.